Welcome to part two of GYN Histology Basics. Today we're going to talk about artifacts and metaplasia. We'll start with artifacts, and in pathology when we talk about an artifact, we're discussing something that we see on the slide that is due to the way the slide was prepared, rather than a process that was actually going on in the patient's tissue. In the endometrium, we're mainly worried about artifactual glandular crowding, which can make us think that some sort of hyperplasia, EIN, or neoplastic process is going on. This is a nice example on this slide of what we call telescoping. So basically, this gland looks architecturally complex with this proliferation extending into the middle of the luminal surface, as you see here. But in actuality, this is just a result of a telescoping process. So if you think about um, a telescope that is used on like an old-timey ship where you slide it into itself. This epithelium has just, as a result of the cutting, slid into the plane of the section, and it's really all part of the same gland. This would all normally be connected. And this is more commonly seen in the secretory phase when the glands develop a corkscrew architecture um, and have a more irregular shape, uh, and they tend to slide into each other like this. We will notice, though, that the cells involved you know, look all the same. They look identical to the surrounding uh, glandular cells in the background, and they're not actually connected to this epithelium at all. They're just sort of floating in the lumen, so that's a nice clue for us. Here is another example of artifactual crowding, and there's two things going on here. One, there is some telescoping going on with some of the gland uh, kind of floating in the luminal surface here. And also you have these two glands that are really close together. But again, this is secretory endometrium. The glands have a very corkscrew shaped architecture here. And it's very easy, depending on the plane of section, for you to just sort of cut obliquely through a gland. And it will appear that there's two glands very close together. But in actuality, this is all just one gland. Um, and if you know, a few things that can help you out in this situation are, one, it's secretory endometrium, and we know we can have some focal crowding there. We're not seeing this diffusely throughout the endometrium, and again, these cells look identical to our background glands, so we're not actually too worried about this process. So this, again, is an example of artifactual glandular crowding. Next, we're going to talk about metaplasias. So one of the things that I think many people find difficult about GYN pathology is malarian cells have a tendency to undergo metaplasia both in benign and even in malignant processes, and they often can recapitulate the appearance of cells elsewhere in the malarian tract, and even some cells that are outside of the normal malarian tract. The most important metaplasia that we run into in the endometrium is squamous metaplasia, and there's two types. The first type is non-morular metaplasia. Let's take a look at that in the next slide. Non-morular squamous metaplasia is squamous metaplasia where the surface of the endometrium undergoes a squamous change and develops into a stratified squamous epithelium like we might see at other sites. And if you look at the surface here, you can see how if you just had this detached from everything else, it would look pretty similar to the squamous epithelium you'd see on the exocervix, for example. But we can see that it's actually overlying directly endometrial stroma and endometrial glands. So this is actually squamous epithelium that is lining the endometrium. This typically occurs in the setting of chronic irritation. In this particular patient, it was due to chronic endometritis related to IUD use. So those repeated episodes of chronic endometritis uh, eventually developed into this stratified squamous metaplasia on the surface. Uh, and again, this is most often benign. Non-morular squamous metaplasia is typically benign and is typically related to chronic irritation. Here's a higher power view of this non-morular squamous metaplasia. Again, we see that the cytology of the cells involved looks quite bland. Uh, there's no atypia here, just looks like a nice stratified squamous epithelium. When you get this type of non-morular metaplasia covering the entire inside surface of the uterus, uh, it's been called in the past um, 
ichthyosis uteri. So that's one older term you may hear associated with this arising in the setting of chronic irritation. And again, this is most typically benign. On the other hand, squamous morular metaplasia, while it may be uh, benign in itself, is often associated with hyperplasias, EIN, and sometimes endometrioid carcinomas. So whenever you see squamous morular metaplasia, you want to really be on the lookout for a pathologic process in the glands. Here is an example of squamous morular metaplasia arising uh, in association with EIN, or endometrioid intraepithelial neoplasia. The reason this is called squamous morular metaplasia is instead of a nice stratified squamous layer covering the surface, you get these balls or morules of squamous epithelium that are arising in the endometrium. And these are most often non-keratinizing, as you see here. They're tightly associated with these glands. Um, and whenever you see these, you want to really take a close look at the background glands to determine if there is some sort of pathologic process here. So I know this is a lecture on benign endometrium, but I want to show you this morular metaplasia because although you know the morulars themselves are considered inert, they are often associated with some sort of pathologic process, including EIN and endometrioid carcinomas. So just keep that in mind and keep that separate in your mind from non-morular squamous metaplasia. This is just a higher power view of a squamous morule, as you can see here, forming that kind of rounded up structure. And I mentioned that these morules are often non-keratinizing, but sometimes you can see some uh, keratinization as you see in this example. So let's sum up squamous metaplasia quickly. Remember there are two types. You have your non-morular metaplasia, which is typically associated with benign processes, chronic irritation, infection, IUD, etc. And you also have morular metaplasia, which again forms these morules or rounded balls. This is not usually something that occurs in normal endometrium. So if you see it, you want to look closely and evaluate the glands nearby to see if you can find an EIN or an endometrial endometrioid carcinoma that could be associated with it. Now let's move on to our non-squamous metaplasias. The main reason to be aware of these is that as pathologists, we don't want to mistake these for a neoplastic process. However, they're not usually something that we mention in a report. This is an example of tubal metaplasia that's occurring in the endometrium. As you may guess, in this setting of tubal metaplasia, the endometrial cells differentiate towards the fallopian tube epithelium, and you can see cilia at the surface of the cells, which you can kind of see here at the top. You can also get peg cells in here, which are just you know, straight cells without cilia on top that are mixed in at intermittent intervals. And this, you know, looks pretty much exactly like epithelium you'd find in the fallopian tube. This is an example of eosinophilic or sometimes called oxophilic metaplasia. You can see it here on the slide, kind of lining this big glandular space. In this setting, it's exactly what it sounds like. The cells gain more eosinophilic cytoplasm. And sometimes the nuclei look either hyperchromatic or you may be able to see uh, prominent nucleoli, as you can see towards the top of this gland here. The next example we have is of mucinous metaplasia. Here the cells gain apical mucin, and there's a number of different mucinous cells they can look like. Sometimes they can look somewhat intestinal, or they can look more like endocervical glandular cells. Either way, they gain mucin in the apical portion of the cell, as you can see here. The last type of metaplasia I want to discuss is this papillary syncytial metaplasia. This occurs in a specific setting, that of endometrial stromal breakdown, and it's somewhat of a reparative response of the endometrium. So it's during the menses phase, uh, everything's breaking down, and as the stroma condenses, uh, you tend to have these little things that look like um, sort of like papillae, which could make you worried about some sort of carcinoma.
but just note the background endometrial breakdown. Note that the cells look quite bland uh, and be a little bit relaxed when you see this. This is very common during endometrial stromal breakdown. And that concludes our discussion of non-squamous metaplasias. Just remember the key point here is not to mistake any of these for malignancy. The final change I want to talk about today is uh, changes you can see during pregnancy. And the main one is this aria stella reaction, which can occur in cells throughout the GYN tract, but we'll discuss them specifically in the endometrium today. The aria stella phenomenon is pictured nicely here. So you'll see that the cells can look quite atypical if you don't have a history of pregnancy and you're not aware of this phenomenon. Basically, you can have a ton of vacuolar change in the apical portion of the epithelium. So you can see these big vacuoles occurring here. You'll also notice that the nuclei get bigger. They can get hyperchromatic or dark, or they can have punctate nucleoli, as you can see in some of these cells, like this one here. And you also have a ton of secretions within the lumen of the glands, as noted here. And another big clue to this is if you look at the background uh, endometrial stroma, remember when I discussed secretory endometrium, I talked about pre-decidual change. Well, here you have actual decidual change in the stroma. So there's a ton of pink cytoplasm in these stromal cells and a nice clear delineation between the cells. You can see the cell borders of these cells pretty nicely. Um, so just keep that in mind that if you see a decidualized background in this type of change and you don't have any history, think, could this patient be pregnant? So if you don't know this history, things can look quite atypical, but just keep in mind that in the setting of pregnancy, these changes are quite common and it's called the area stella phenomenon. Here's a higher power view to give you a better idea of those cytologic features. Again, you can see really dark hyperchromatic nuclei as noted in this cell here, whereas other cells can have punctate nucleoli. You can also get a sort of hobnailing appearance, which is a bulging of the cells into the glandular space. You can kind of see it in this cell here. And that's a sign that you can see in things like clear cell carcinoma. So if you see this sort of change and you don't have the history, you could be really be worried about a carcinoma here. But again, just keep the history in mind and just remember these features of aria stella reaction. That brings us to our quick points on gestational change. Remember this aria stella reaction, nuclear enlargement, hyperchromasia on the nuclei. These cells have lots of eosinophilic and often vacuolated cytoplasm, and they can have a hobnail appearance. And the key point here is just not to mistake it for malignancy. And with that, we come to the end of part two of our video series. As always, any questions could be directed to me on Twitter, and I'll do my best to answer those. Otherwise, thanks for joining, and I hope you enjoy your time and GYN pathology.